make your own, you know, make your own world, make your own best space. Because when I was at E, that building was across the street from the La Brea Tar Pits or the La Brea Pits. Um, and there's the Page Museum. Then there's also the LA County Museum of Art and everything is over there. So at some point, how many ever months into working at E, I got a membership to LACMA. And I would, we had an hour lunch, so and it was right across the street. So I would take my lunch, I would sit in the park and have my lunch, and then I would go wander around LACMA for like half an hour, 40 minutes. And it was so different and so like not E. You can you can take care of yourself. That's all, it, that's number one, take care of yourself. Hello and welcome to Here in LA, Valley Glen Edition. Today we talk with Rob Takata, a native Angelino who grew up in Monterey Park in the SGV to a family of mixed backgrounds. He was a smart kid and thus attended film school at USC and made his way to Valley Glen in the other valley. Rob is a terrific guy, a great writer, and so smart. He even tells us about the oldest tiki bar in LA. Unlike Paul from the last episode, who I did not know worked at E while I was there decades ago, Rob actually sat right next to me. So we'll see if he has any insights from that rare treat. Let's do it! Hey everybody! I am not here in Virgil. Where where do you live? Valley Glen. It's confusing because it's in the valley and there is Valley Glen. And then there's also Valley Village right next door. And those were all, I believe, subdivided from the greater Van Nuys thing. So it's all, it is a, a bit of a, you know, a word salad out there. You're a smart dude. I was. What happened? <laughs> no, you're a smart dude. Got old. And, um, and so... That's another reason you're going to be great for this podcast is because I'm going to ask you stuff about L.A. You're a native? I, 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 yes. Native Southern Californian, Los Angeles County area person. I, my claim is I was born in the 213, but the 213 was much bigger back then. It, it, but you're almost hesitant to say you're a native Angelino. Well, I wasn't in the city of Los Angeles, so I don't, I don't want anyone to like, uh, you know, fact check me and... Uh, Call me out, and then get then I get canceled for claiming uh, Angelinos. But I have lived in Hollywood. I have lived in West Hollywood. I've lived in the Valley, so I am, you know. Why did you live in West Hollywood? Certainly. Oh, your sunset strip years. Uh, <laughs> close. No, I mean I moved out. I I was had been living with someone. We split up. I had to find a place. I found a affordable at the time apartment, like right near Fairfax and Santa Monica, right where. I found out in the first year where the gay pride parade starts, which I found out early one Sunday morning. <laughs> Fairfax and Santa Monica. Yeah, there's a Whole Foods there now. There's a tiny post office. Oh, right by the Grove. No, 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 no. Santa Monica. Santa Monica Boulevard. So Why can't I picture this? Santa Well, you know where Fairfax High is. Yes. Just go up there to Santa Monica Boulevard. Fairfax okay. and Melrose. And just go up there to Santa Monica and you're right there. Oh yes, it's kind of the Russian-y era area. Do you do you uh, watch uh, Emma Chamberlain on uh, YouTube? Do you know her at all? Uh -uh, no, good for you. She's I think she's twenty, but she used to go to that Whole Foods all the time. And oh. I was like, I know where that Whole Foods is. I will tell you, and this is not a great story. But when I moved there, it was a Ralph's, and it was like not a good Ralph's. It uh -huh. was, I mean, it, it like. All the Ralphs, ha Ralphs, Ralphs, Ralphs have names and they're, you know, it's rock and roll Ralphs down the way. And this was sort of because it was the Russian air, but it was Russian Ralphs. Yeah. Like the produce wasn't good. It was just like not a good place. And then it closed. Big sign went up, said Whole Foods coming soon. And I was like, you know, I almost cried. Yeah. And it finally opened up and it was, you know, it's Whole Foods. It it's was great. And it's a small one, but it's, it was nice and it's wonderful. And, uh, and, and oddly, the parking is not an issue with that Whole Foods. Not too bad. And I was so close. I walked there. I was a half a block away from there. So I could walk there. It was magical. Good post office, too. That was right around the corner from me. I mean, that's yeah. right on my corner, essentially. Yeah. yeah. And uh, walk walkable to the Okie Dog. Yeah, certainly. Yeah. If you're drunk <laughs> enough. And you kind of have to be <laughs> if you're going to Okie Dog, right? Okay. So tell me about Valley Glen. What What is there? What What's the... What's the, our, the, 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 the cool place to be? Well, my valley journey was I grew up San Gabriel Valley, mm -hmm. different valley. And then I lived in Hollywood for a while, as I said. 
Um, and I was, you know, sort of anti Valley. Never wanted to move out there because it's hot. It's, you know, vast, you know, land of nothing out there. Too much parking. Too much parking. Too many. As I was moving out there going, this is the land of two story apartment buildings. Yeah. And th- that is, it, that's exactly what it With is. With a pool in the middle, right? Uh, a lot of them do. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, not mine. But <laughs> uh, so I'm Valley Glen is where I am is if you take the uh, 405 and the 170 and the 101 and go two miles each direction, you know, from each of those places, you'll basically land it where I am. That's sort of the heart of or more or less the center of Valley Glen. So close to North Hollywood. North Hollywood's going to be a little to the east. Yep. Um, and uh, Sherman Oaks to the south. Um, gosh, what's right directly north of us? Uh, you're going to get up into Pacoima a little further up there. But right. I don't know if that's um, immediately above us. And then like sort of Encino to the northwest. And you're in the heart of the valley. It's it's dead center in this sort of valley valley, not the west valley, not the right. other side of the 405 valley. But uh, yeah, pretty, pretty central. Super convenient to be around all those freeways. And yes, it is actually. 170 is one of my favorite freeways. It's very nice. Because nobody uses it. Absolutely. Uh, you're near a bunch of good movie theaters. You uh, Unfortunately, the the Arclight, Sherman Oaks, is now no longer the Arclight. Um, so I don't get to go there. And also because pandemic, I haven't been to a theater in two years. So, Well, actually, I've been to one theater. But uh, now at the Landmark, all the way down, which is now closing as well. You didn't go see a licorice pizza at, in Westwood? No, no. Which was actually uh, filmed around my neighborhood. Right. Like on my walk, I would pass them, you know, a couple times when they were shooting over kind of near Grant High, not at Grant High, but over like the neighborhoods over there. And I think they shot near the at the. Uh, you haven't seen the, it. No, I want to. I was go- I was going to watch it pre Oscars, and then I was like, let's let's check it out. And I think it's like three hours long, and I was like, <sighs> that's a it's commitment. Long. It's long, and it doesn't need to be that long. Yeah. But I want to, I, I, you know, I like his films. I want to watch it. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll see it. Yeah. Um, okay. What are the hot spots of Valley Glen? Well, the hot spots, that's a good question. Right near me, sort of interesting, is a place called Barone's. Kind of old school Italian joint, like oh. a red sauce kind of Italian joint. When you walk in there. Tablecloths? Uh, yeah, I believe they have tablecloths. Yeah. Okay. Um, and you walk in there and it go like, oh, this is a kind of old schooly looking place, kind of, you know, red booths and all that. And you're like, this stuff looks kind of weird and European, like German. And then you come to find out it was a German restaurant before that. <laughs> now, Barone's existed for uh, elsewhere in the valley prior to moving there. But the German place that was there was the setting for the scene no! in Fast Times at Ridgemont what? High where, uh, where uh, Damone has to bring him his wallet. Yes. Yeah, where, where the, 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 the chairs were so tall yes. to make them look like they were little kids, basically. Yes, I don't know if those are the re- those may have been there then. I don't think they're there now. But uh, yeah, that's the that's the setting for uh, uh, that scene. In oh, Fast my Times. Rob Takata. <laughs> Minute eight already with the gems. Cool movie reference. Have you. OK, so how's the Italian food? Is it OK? It's good. It's very like it's, you know, it's not haute cuisine. It is, you know, Italian American y red sauce. Yep. Their uh, like cheese lasagna is incredible because it's (laughs) packed with cheese and how could it be bad, (laughs) you know? And, uh, you know, you can't go too far wrong with, you know, something that's smothered, your pasta smothered in red sauce. And get a glass of Chianti and you're doing great. And they have square pizza for some reason, you know, it's square. It's good, solid. Good for a date, would you say? Sure. Yeah. If your date, I mean, it's it has a kind of old schooly. It, you know, it's kind of like uh, well, I, I, I think of the Dresden, but think of like you know, not as fancy. You know, in a way. <laughs> the bar side of the Dresden, not the restaurant side of the Dresden. You know. But if I want to take a a seventeen year old Jennifer Jason Lee, <laughs> yes, and impress her, if you can find one legally. <laughs> Okay, fine. What about a 55-year-old Jennifer Jason Lee? I'm sure she'd probably go with you. Well, I don't know. That might be a bit of a cliche for her. That movie is, to me, is, is so dear to my heart. And there's very few other places you can go to. All American Burgers are gone. What a the, better place to really enjoy that movie than there. Yeah, and the mall, I I never went to that Galleria before back in the day. So I can't even picture how what's there now 
is what was there then. I've tried to imagine, and it's just not. You yeah. can't do it. I, and I, th- it's the same building, as far as I know. I'm sure. Yeah, sure it's the same structure. I think they, so I kind of, I think it's kind of like Santa Monica Place. They they took the the roof they off, punched a hole in it, yeah, and um, rearranged some stuff. Yeah, but you would think that the guts of it would be the same. Yeah, it's hard to look around and go like, yeah, where was the where was that movie theater and where, where was, was that the, pizza place? Pizza place, exactly. Okay, well, Valley Glen, you've done it. Yeah, that's is, right. Is, that- is there any other? Okay, is there good food there? Is there like a, like a kick ass taco place? Um, well, you know what? It's funny because you were asking about Valley Glen, so I was like, well, let me look at the borders and everything. And I was looking at, it, I was like, oh, that's across the street. Oh, this place is like. <laughs> That's just over the thing. That's just like everything was like a block or like, uh, you know, a hundred feet outside of Valley Glen. You know, there's a, you know, Hugo's is down there, but Hugo's is in Valley Village. It's literally across the street. Um, the, the the Hugo's that used to be in, in West Hollywood? Oh, I believe that's still there. There was, there was only a Valley one. There was a Valley one and there's West oh, Hollywood. I didn't know I that. I believe West Hollywood's still there. I've been in West Hollywood. You, a long you never time. know these days with the COVID. Exactly. Um, so, but yes, that Hugo's is there. That's one of actually the first restaurants that I went to post lockdown. That I actually, you know, because they have sort of open space in there, and it's nice. And yeah. Um, but that's Valley Village, literally across the street. Um, there's the cool, brand new, like robotic Whole Foods Market where you don't have to check out. You just that's walk right. in and walk out is right there, and it's kind of fun. Is that Coldwater Canyon? That's Coldwater and, and like Riverside. Riverside? Yeah. yeah. Ooh, have you been to the Gino's East Pizza? I have been, and that's probably also in Valley Village. And that yeah. was one of the last places I went to pre-print, pre-pandemic. I, I think technically that's Sherman Oaks. because I, I Sherman Oaks, yes. Yeah, I, right, I want right. to interview those dudes. Okay, Rob, you grew up where? Uh, I grew up in Monterey Park, which is San Gabriel Valley. It's the other valley. Do does does do the people of San Gabriel Valley get pissed off when people say the valley? I don't. And think they, they and care. they don't mean San Gabriel Valley. They they always mean San Fernando Valley. I I I didn't care, and I don't know that other people care. I don't know if the population there now cares or Good. thinks about it at all. I think it's kind of like. L.A. and San Francisco, where L.A. likes San Francisco and we like to visit San Francisco and San Francisco hates L.A. and, you know, thinks thinks we're terrible. And we're like, oh, well, you know, it, it was they pretend to hate us. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't I don't know that there's a there's not an intense rivalry between Good. the two. And they're very, I mean, very different, but they are different places. Well, I, I ask because I get fact checked all the time because mm. I love saying the valley and there's always going to be a commenter like which valley, Tony? Whatever. Everyone knows what you're saying when you say the valley. Okay, everyone... so you grew up in Monterey Park. Monterey Park. Which in is... the 70s. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, late 60s, You're, you're Gen 70s. X. Absolutely, yes. Uh, Bleeding edge of Gen X, yeah. And um, so what was it like out there growing up? Um, it was, you know, Monterey Park, it, it's not new-ish. It, it was established, I think, goes back to the 20s or earlier. I've randomly, you know, seen all these great old pictures of, like, buildings that I know there and then nothing else there, which are kind of amazing and fun to look at. Um, you know, I grew up in one of those sixties subdivisions up in the Hills. Um, and, uh, a cul-de-sac kind of a situation. There were cul-de-sacs on off of our street, but I was on the street that, uh, was not the cul-de-sac. Uh, but you felt safe riding your bicycle around. Oh yeah. I mean, except for the fact that I lived on a bit of a hill and you know, you either had to walk your bike up or fly down the hill the other direction. Um, but you know, that was just fun and everything was, you know, did you skateboard down uh, this hill? I never stood skateboarding down that hill because it would have been scary. Yeah. Um, with the gear of the time, you know, circa 19, what, 73, 75, that era. Yeah. And, uh, and the asphalt and all the little bumps (laughs) and the fact there's a little turn at the bottom of the hill and all the rest of that, it was, we would do the, uh, we would do the, uh, catamaran where it'd be two people sitting facing each other on the skateboards and you could put your legs across the other person and I've got to, I that seems how even we, more dangerous it seems like it is and i'm trying to remember how we managed to maintain our uh or not maintain our speed to slow down but um right um but yeah i mean it was it's like everyone refers to oh back then we could 
be out until the lights came on. Uh, you know, I walked to school in third grade. Yep. Um, you know, so when I'm eight years old, used to go down to the save on in Atlantic square and get ice cream and whatnot. Did you lock your bike in front of the save on? Uh, yeah, I probably did lock my bike back then. Yeah. I don't know. Did you lock your bike in front of your buddy's house? Uh, Cause we didn't probably just dropped it inside or so. I don't know that uh, we no. left it out. Might've left it out in well, front. Th- that was the thing. That's how you knew yeah. your buddies were at your friend's houses. Shitload of bikes. Probably right. Yeah. On actually, their sides. Yeah, yeah. Not even kickstands. Just throw them down. That's probably a little anal. I probably put <laughs> kickstand down on mine. <laughs> Had it. There I'm was always use one. It. Use it. I already kicked it off. Kicked it, <laughs> kicked it over. But, uh, but I think those were better times. Is this, is this us being old men? Oh yeah. Yeah. All old men think this way. Yeah. Remember when milk was a nickel? Yeah, exactly. It, I mean, yeah, this exact same thing. I'm thinking of the ice cream cones that were like 20 cents and they were enormous. Did you have ice cream trucks out in Monterey Park? There were. I didn't frink with them that much and they didn't stop on the big hill that much either. You kind of <laughs> had to go out there and like, you know, wave them down. But by the elementary school nearby, there would want, be one that was parked out there after school every day and stuff. And Rob Takata. Mm-hmm. Half Japanese. Half Japanese, yeah. Were what was the demographics of your high, of your school when you were going to school out there? Um, that's a good question. I don't have a great number for you, but Monterey Park had a significant like Asian American population, and that was Japanese American, Chinese American. You know, um, you know, slow influx of in the seventies of Vietnamese and more Chinese. Um, but yeah, when I was a kid there, there were you know I was a Japanese kid among lots of other Japanese kids, but I also had, you know, there were plenty of, you know, uh, Mexican kids. We called them Mexican kids back then. Were they mostly from Mexico? Probably. But I think you can't, you can't blanket call people. It was the seventies anymore. Yeah. Different time. What do you think we called Asian people? Exactly. What what did they call Asian people? I think everyone was Chinese. That's right. (laughs) Did you take offense when they called you Chinese? Well, that's the weird thing. So I had a weird, I was a weird crossover. So, Asian people, Japanese American people, especially, you know, no, you, they can sniff out the 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 hapa, which is the Hawaiian term that we, uh, uh, you know, in in a crowd, um, and you know, we weren't so Asian that you know white kids would uh, shun us. Not that they were doing that either, <laughs> but also um, where I'm situated, Monterey Park, and if you know it, is just above you know sort of East LA Boyle Heights, and so. You know, I looked as Mexican as I looked white as I looked Asian, really, you know, depending depending on what uh, crowd I was among. So, you know, it was uh, I, you know, I think I sort of either flew under or over a lot of people's radar and and it wasn't a thing. It just kind of wasn't a thing. As somebody who doesn't look identifiable, it's a superhero, isn't it? Superpower, isn't it? Somewhat. Yeah. Yeah. Or at least the at least the belief that no one cares or no one notices was, was, you know, enough of a shield to, to, you know, get by back then. I think. But you're totally right though. The tribe knows who you are. Yeah. Which is great. Cause that's really the only ones that I want to know who I am. Often before they even hear your name. Well, in the, on the Asian side, the name, the yes. name stands out obviously. <laughs> right. Although I know I have people that knew me for many years, knew my name and thought I was Mexican. I was like, really? <laughs> come on. But you also have the, this comic book store guy mentality from The Simpsons, which is you do know more than the average guy and you will look down on them and judge. <laughs> and so if they said to you, hey, uh, OK, we want the black guy and the China guy to be on our kickball team. You'd be like, does Takata sound Chinese to you, sir? Exactly. Yeah. Were you that kind of a kid? Um, I probably I probably would be amongst people I know. I don't know if I'd call out a stranger, but then I probably wasn't playing kickball with a lot of strangers back then, <laughs> probably at school. And that's the thing. Where I was, there was, you know, there were, you know, Itos and Kitagamis and Kanagais and all those, you know, in, in my classes and stuff. So there were a lot of, you know, Japanese kids. And just kind of was the, you know... Uh, it wasn't odd. It wasn't like out of the ordinary to, you know, to be among Asians. Mom or dad was uh, Japanese. Dad. Did dad want you to um, really embrace your Japanese side? You know, that's the other thing from my, you know, from the family. There was not a ton of pressure to be any particular thing. You know, I was, my dad was born in California and he, all his family, like his parents were immigrants, but 
my dad and all his siblings and everything were born in Northern California near Sacramento. Um, and so, uh, you know, they're American. They're, they were the they were the Americans that got thrown in camps, you know, in 1942. Oh, really? Yeah. So. Wow. So, yeah. So there wasn't. Your, there was, your dad was in a camp? Yeah. My dad, grandparents, all his siblings and everything. Did that fuck him up? Um, Did he talk I, about it? I can't say that it did. Yeah, he certainly talked about it. It wasn't a hidden away thing or anything like that. It was a weird thing because and you can talk to Japanese. Like if you talk to Japanese. Japanese American kids of my, you know, my age. Yeah. About that time growing up and parents talking about it, you'd hear your parents talking about camp. <laughs> and they were like, camp. All right. And it didn't really register. And over time, you started to understand and figure out what it was. And because schools weren't teaching about it, certainly. I'm sure yeah. you didn't learn about it when you were in grade school nope. or even in high school. Nope. Um, and most people didn't. And, you know, I did learn about it over over the years, but it was never a hidden away thing. It was never, a, you know, there was no push to make me more Japanese or less Japanese. I didn't, you know, my dad didn't force my brother and I to go to Japanese school, which is Saturday, you know, language school, you know, a bit of a, a acculturation and things like that. And mm -hmm. at the time, thanks, I get to watch cartoons. Now I'm like, dad, you should have forced us to go to Japanese school. I could, you know, probably get a better job. <laughs> <laughs> that sort of thing. Or I could at least order in a restaurant or whatever. But um, so, yeah, there wasn't a big, you know, press to be one or the other thing or, mm -hmm. you know, both. And I think that's kind of I sort of flow freely among them pretty, pretty easily. You... But I know that's not unique. I know, in fact, weirdly, younger generations are having more problem with it than certainly I had when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. and I think we're sort of in a weird sweet spot of. Even though I was born when, and I know it didn't apply as much to Asian Americans, but when like the loving decision came out, you know, it was around basically when I was born. Um, but that time and in California probably helped being out here. Yeah. It, it, it you know, wasn't, it didn't feel like or seem like an issue. Did the, uh, did any of the girls not want to date you because of your Asian half side? Doesn't sound no, like I, it. I, you know, well, I was, not, you know, I was not the biggest of daters even through high school. But no, the, you know, uh, uh, you know, the girls I kissed were, you know, all kinds of, well, really, actually, none of them Japanese. But <laughs> so um, uh, I, I don't think it was. I don't, I don't think it was an issue. And I don't think it certainly hasn't been an issue over, you know, over the years. God bless Southern California. Yeah. Yeah. We're lucky. I mean, we. It, it's a it's a big comfy bubble, I think, but you know it's a nice one to be in. We worked at E together. We did. That's E with an exclamation mark if people don't know. Um, I started in the closed caption department. You did. Where did you start? Did, were you always in scheduling? I started in scheduling, yeah. How did you, how did you get that job? Um, I knew a person. I mean, it's like, it's Hollywood, man. You have to know somebody. I knew somebody too. I worked at, um, previous that I worked at a literary agency. Repta uh, TV Literally writers. a literary? Literally a literary agency. <laughs> um, and uh, rep TV writer. I was not an agent. I was an agent's assistant. It was a small boutique agency. Um, but one of the other guys there, his wife worked at E. And she had been in scheduling. And she moved on to, uh, you know, doing uh, graphics and stuff there. And I just got the, you know, referral through through her. So, Did you not like your previous job? Um, I... Because it wasn't like we were getting paid a lot at E. No. I... I left that job because again that was like a I I didn't I was not on a path to become an agent I didn't want to become an agent it was not like the thing it was just the job that I could get that was in the industry and paid me enough to live on and you know and I I learned plenty there and it was actually you know it's a good education yeah um but uh you know eventually moved on from there and I'm trying to think because I feel like I feel like we were done wrong Oh, uh, well, that place was ripping people off. We were, Everyone that worked there was, was emotionally, <laughs> financially like, yes, it was. You talk about how you wish you had probably gone to the dorms your first year or 
any other school outside mm-hmm. of LA. Even though I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that I met you and all these other people. I mean, I started blogging at E because I was so, I, I hated my entire life. And I was like, I hate it all. I need to make up this lie to, to, to my what? senses. It wasn't real? Oh, my God. <laughs> because I cannot believe that I've fallen this far. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Did you feel the same way? Oh, it was, you know, it was the, it, the it's a bit of a bait and switch because you probably got this pitch like, oh, we uh, promote from inside and blah, blah, blah. And you can, you know, all, all this stuff. And it was great. But after being there for a little bit and wanting to, you know, get promoted, you were, eh, it's probably true of a lot of businesses, but you could only get promoted really in your department. Right. Like, and I didn't want to stay in schedule. I, I would move over to production. I would have wanted to be on for true sure. Hollywood stories or for sure. whatever, probably that alone. Yeah. But, um, uh, there was, it's like, okay, you can, but you have, you're going to be a PA right. and probably lose money in the already small pittance that they're paying us. Which is so cruel. And I will, I, I'll, Fact check me. I'm telling you this. <laughs> um, if you remember correctly, that the annual raise was two yeah. percent. That was the maximum raise. That's right. And two percent of what we were making was not very much money. I think I was making like thirty grand. Probably, maybe probably thirty-two, right. thirty-three yeah, at the most. Right. Like before taxes. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's probably. My blog right. is called the bus blog because I needed to ride the bus to go to work. I could not afford to buy a car. The, well, the, the the part that was super galling about that was that they would tell you, oh, to get that raise, that 2% raise, you had to walk on water. Yeah. You had to be, you know, if I was a religious person, I'd be offended. It's like, I have to be Jesus Christ for a 2% raise. Not even the disciples could walk on water. No. And Jesus never even like told them to. Exactly. He didn't even say, if you had the faith of a mustard seed, you too could walk on water. No. Because that is special. Moses never walked on water. He did some cool water tricks. Moses though. had incredible water tricks. Couldn't walk on it. Yeah. But you're absolutely right. Moses would have not gotten the 2%. No. They're like, sorry. <laughs> you walked through it, but you did not walk on it. And you also killed it. those Hebrews. Yeah, exactly. And so, I <laughs> know, uh, I think he actually, it was the no, when Egyptians, he was young, I believe. it was. Oh, he killed the Egyptians. That's yeah. right. Because he was he in was Asia. leading the Hebrews out, if I'm No, when he mistaken. was younger, Moses killed somebody. Oh, okay. That's why he never made it to the promised land. I've seen the movies. I haven't read the book, so. Which is rare for you. True. I, I, I weirdly got a chunk of sort of religious education just in my other education. You know, not. Uh, but I'm saying usually you have read the book for the movie that you like. Often. Yeah. Often enough. Um, so, yes, it was bait and switch. None of us got any raises. None of us were happy. Exactly. And by the way, we had an incredible crew. Yeah. There were some bad apples, of course. Yeah. But for the most part, really, really talented people. Yeah. If if we were to build a team, I would pick most of those people. Yeah. You know? <laughs> some of. Some of. I was shaking his head. No, there were some really good people. None of the managers that managed us and Chip. He was above he, but he was above and sort of outside of he wasn't directly right. Uh, but yes, absolutely. He got he promoted cool. because he did walk on water. Yeah. He was really great. He had the hair. He had the hair. He had the cool accent. And, um, and he knew how to manage people, yeah. which was also rare yeah. at that place. Oh, everyone was. A, uh, it was terrible. Okay. I, I, I set it up. PTSD, thinking about I, it now. PTSD. Kind of? Oh, look at you. Sorry. That was bad. Okay. I set it up this way to bring it around this way. What positives did you get out of being in this terrible boiler situation by the way our job as schedulers we everything production wise came through our yeah. office oh yeah we were the narrow point every everyone if you wanted to get something on the air get something shot it had to come through us or edited everything well everything uh, every element had to every come element us. and and we're not saying that to brag i'm kind of saying that to complain and just so people understand if you're not scheduling isn't like we're not putting the programs on the schedule and saying what hour they're going to play. We Howard were the, Stern should be on at noon. Exactly. We were the people that put together the cameramen with the crews and the editors with the, uh, you know, all the crews that were doing their things. We, we scheduled those people who were available to do work. So some of the rooms that, that I scheduled were the audio 
uh, recording studios, mm -hmm. um, the uh, Moco paint box. I think you. I think you. You moved into what I had been doing. Oh. And then I moved into doing the uh, the camera and audio guys. Right. So I was scheduling the guys going out on shoots, and you were doing post production, and then like audio. Yes. And, and so you had the, you had the like crews, yes. the vans and the crews. Yes, exactly. That was after. That was the second. Like I moved over to that from yeah. uh, from uh, the post production stuff. So, so again, I say this not to brag, as if there's any bragging about this, but because everything went through us, we got blamed for everything that fucked up, and not credited for anything. Never. Never. No. Never. Because because. Whatever. So, so because of that, I feel like our well, our our level of making errors couldn't even be there. We, we could not make an error. No. So, um, so we kind of learned how to cover our own ass. And one way to do that was we shunned phone calls because there was no paper trail. True. The phone still rang off the hook. True. But we would say write an email. Yeah. You were great about it. Oh, uh, yeah. Put it in writing or I'm not going to do whatever you're asking because I need you to ask me for it. And there would be. And then you'd hang up because yeah. <laughs> they always want to debate. They're like, come on, I'm driving on the one. It's like, I don't care. Email us what you want. Yeah. And after a while, we trained the whole oh, yeah. studio yeah. how to work. Yeah. And everything came through email. Uh, we still made mistakes. I mean, mistakes happen. And um, and the show, the shows worked. All the shows happened. Yeah. Nothing didn't happen. Yeah. But we still got yelled at and we didn't get our 2%. Mm -mm. No, because obviously we screwed up the, in, you know, we the were the one ones time. who screwed up. Exactly. And I can't even think of like, I mean, there must have been someone that didn't show up or something or whatever, but I don't know that there was scheduling errors. You know, the only mistake that are the only sort of thing that I can think of that we weren't able to do was like, if there just weren't enough people or there weren't enough freelancers or there weren't enough whatever. Yes. And you had to like somehow shuffle people around or push one show earlier or later to, you know, yeah. in editing or whatever. But, you know, a lot of it was not even up to us. Like news had X number of bays every right. day all the time. And they had X number of crews every day. And so yes. a lot of that was kind of set and it was just juggling all the rest of those things. It was still hard. And um, anyways, OK, so my point, my question to you, though, is did you learn anything positive off of this terrible experience? Don't work at E. Oh, come on. Um, no, I mean, I think it's all it's all people stuff, probably just dealing with, you know, it's that that uh, uh, how to deal with, et cetera. You know, and the, the way that I've integrated that into my life is never working at a big company again after that. <laughs> You know, that's the biggest company I've, I have worked at and probably uh, I, obviously at this point will ever work at. But hmm. it was like any anyone that's had an office job at a you know company that's with more than 20 people has experienced a lot of probably what we experienced there. It wasn't much different than that. It wasn't glamorous what we were doing working, quote, in Hollywood. Not at all. Not one bit. No. I mean, LL Cool J played our party. That was nice. Did it? You don't remember that? Oh, that was probably after I left. Right after you left? Yeah. LL Cool J played? It was, uh, it was, um, I'm sorry to hear that. He was great. Who's the guy? Are you an LL fan? Dated. I, I would have been into it. That would have been fun. He would been, he would have been the best one of all the ones that had been there. Cause it was, uh, who's the guy that dated Jennifer Aniston? Dreadlock guy. Uh, uh, Brad Pitt from, no, uh, no. True, True pre, Romance? Pre earlier. <laughs> Uh, no, nah, I can't. It's, it's actually good. I can't remember the bands that were there, but, um, <laughs> you know, they were always kind of like on the down. It was always sort of on the down. Yeah. Kind of band, which was bizarre because he tried so hard to be the center of Hollywood entertainment. They never got exclusive interviews. They couldn't even afford the music. So when, when they did do like a Rihanna special it was always fake canned music. Yeah. Meanwhile, a week later, VH1 behind the music was 10 times better. Yeah. I mean, it was it was odd. Well, they just didn't spend money on anything. I mean, like if you sit down and watch a true Hollywood story and pay attention, yeah, you will see the same moving still a half dozen to ten times. You will hear the same music cue, which is not music actually related to whatever you're watching. <laughs> it's music that sounds kind of like that. Like there's a, 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 a Sammy Davis Jr. 
Uh, Loved one. that one. Great. Singer, musician, dancer, not one lick of music by Sammy Davis Jr. in that thing. Which, okay. They must have made a huge profit on all of these low budget, low paying employees. Th- that was that was never in their mix. And and in nineteen ninety no, sorry, uh, two thousand on two thousand, how expensive could it have been to license, you know, Candyman or right. something, Mr. Bojangles at that point point in time. Also, these are infomercials for these people. And for these for these uh, music catalogs, well, he was dead at that point in time. But yeah, but but still, but his 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 uh, what do estate. you call it? His estate, yeah, yeah. would have loved this. His label, Capital or whatever, would have loved this. You'd, you'd have you 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 couldn't have worked out any kind of a deal. Okay, fine. We'll do another one about Dean next week if you give us the music for Sammy this week. They never even tried. It seems like. Yeah, they just didn't. It was it was it was cheap. It was budget. They were just everything was you know, low budget. And that's why they went from that stuff. It actually required them to do work and write stuff and find assets to, you know, you were there when it was Anna Nicole Smith and she's just the predecessor to the horrible, uh, you know, Kardashians and all that. Were you there when uh, Schwarzenegger visited? No, no. He was governor, and he was going to visit the news. I, if he, if and he, he did, didn't show up. Oh, if he did, I don't remember it. I right. certainly don't remember it. The only celebrity quote, big quotes that I remember coming anywhere near where we were was Dr. Drew walked past us one time because they were shooting something out on a balcony nearby there. Right. And then right before I left, the girl from Survivor started working there. Yeah. From the first Survivor. Yeah. That's Jenna? Like, Maybe? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. 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 That's, that's, as, that's as big as the stars got. You never went there. down to the studio to uh, poke your head in when somebody for, was there? For news? No. Yeah. No. I did. I knew uh, Cheryl Hines, who was, on, uh, who was on Curb. Yes. I just knew her from before, from friends at the Groundlings and everything. So one time she was coming in, and I just sort of said hi to her as she was going in. And it was just like, that was it. And... Other than that, yeah. It's not, it's not glamorous in the least. No. It's the opposite of glamour. I do still have an e-coffee mug that I use. I, I used to have, I, I think I still have my talk soup, soup bowl. Because remember they would have little yeah. uh, like rummage sales? Yeah. They would, they would charge <laughs> us to wear and use e-paraphernalia. And the, the mug I have is something that I got for free. So that's the only reason I have I think it. I paid five bucks for my talk suit, suit bowl, which lasted 20 years. I tried to flip it on eBay. Nobody cared. <laughs> okay. Let's wrap it up with uh, Valley Glen. Where do you live? Valley Glen. Valley Glen. Um, look, it's a, it's a nice, you know, it's suburban. You know, people think L.A., like we were talking about, is, you know, it's just all Hollywood. And it's not all Hollywood. It's mostly not Hollywood. Um, it's suburban. It's, you know, you are surrounded by these warehouses that have all of the costumes and all of the stage, you know, stuff and all of the post-production stuff. But it's all plain warehouses and you don't recognize it from the street. Um, and it's just, it's mellow. Uh, well, it's the... It, it, you're making it sound like, uh, remember Punch Drunk Love? Yeah. Speaking of another PTA movie? Yeah. Remember when Adam Sandler was working in that like bad warehouse? Yeah, it's probably out. It's probably not too far from where I live now. I'd probably have to go back and look at it and yeah. figure it out. But yeah, because because Anderson is from he grew up in the valley. He, right. That's all his area. So that's why that's why it's a lot of that. Stuff but you're there. absolutely right. When I was growing up in Illinois, I, I only pictured Venice and Santa Monica Beach. Hollywood and, Boulevard. Maybe a little bit about that. Yeah. Um, but. And that's kind of the reason I'm doing this podcast is I'm trying to show people, no, L.A. probably has more in common where with wherever you're from oh, absolutely. than it does, you know, where you think Brad Pitt is right now. Oh, L.A.'s history is it was agricultural and then it was oil 
and then it was uh, industry. And, you know, it was all these things that have, you know, moved on from here. They've made cars here. They made planes here. You know, they made wine here. Uh, but that's, again, all in the past. Um, and they've made a lot of porn here. In the valley. Rob not Takata. my part of the valley, but uh, oh. yes, definitely out in the valley somewhere. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it's ma it's mainly suburban where I am. L.A. Valley College is nearby. Ah. It was a night. The whole, I'll say this. When lockdown started, I started going out for a daily walk because you had to do something to get outside. Um, and so I just walked around through the college and just around the area and, um, you know, got to experience it. And it's just an, it's a pretty decent, pleasant enough place to walk. You see coyotes pretty regularly. Do you? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it has. Oh, this is a very nice feature. Do I want to see coyotes regularly? They don't bother you. They won't bother you. They're they're scaredy cats. And the, if you had a small dog or cat with you, they might be interested. But otherwise, they're they wow. Just, they just trot away. Um, nice thing about Valley Glen, the Orange Line Busway cuts through Valley Glen. But along the Orange Line Busway is a little path, a little pedestrian and bike path. And that was a big part of my walk. And it's very it's pleasant. There's you know, you're just behind people's houses. It's you know, there's a lot of it's got trees and, you know, it's quiet and it's just it's a nice little thing sort of in the middle of town. So if you really <clears> did <throat> want to come here through public transpo, you could just oh, take that orange bus. It's the, to yeah, the, yeah, red the stop line. is a stone throw from where I live. Go down to the red line. Yes, I absolutely could have. But I would have had to be on a bus and a train. Right. When there's a, I don't know how many variants do we have? Have you have you dodged all of them? Yeah. Me too. Yeah. But like I said, the reason I'm, you know, didn't want to do stuff indoors is, is in the past four to five months, I've seen more people Me online too. posting about how they got it, how friends got it than I did at all in 2020. Yeah. And so I'm like, well, yeah, I'm, I'm that's why I'm. Why do you think that's happening? Well, because everyone thinks everything's OK. So they're going to concerts and they're going to restaurants and they're going to bars and they're you know, going on podcast. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, they're just everyone's living like, uh, you know. Everything's it's no big okay. deal. Um, so yeah, that's why I sold my tickets to a concert last weekend, and why. Who are you supposed to see? Tears for Fears, garbage oh, yeah. opening, and a lot of people I know. Yeah. Learned. And I just was like, Ash, ah, not right, you know, comfortable for it. I saw videos on YouTube. Yeah. Didn't seem that. I've seen Tears incredible. for Fears before. I've seen Garbage before. Garbage is great. They're both great. Yeah. But it's just well, you know, I didn't get to see them this time. Were you able to sell your tickets? Yeah, a little bit of a loss, but was able to sell them. Yeah. It happens. Um, but yeah, that Valley, sorry, I'll, I'll, just, oh, no, go ahead. I'll go back to Valley Glen and say it has its own little things. This orange line bus path is nice. The fact that there's this dedicated public transit thing going right through it is really nice. It's fast. And it, it's fast because what they did was instead of spending billions making light rail, they took st Existing streets, maybe they built a street or it, two. I think it actually was old. It was a rail line at some point down. I don't know if it was. And they pulled up the, the, the rails. Yeah, I don't know if it was red line stuff or if it was uh, or a red car stuff or right. if it was other industrial stuff. But you can see some little bits of old uh, a rail stuff still along there. So, th so they made dedicated bus routes through the valley, which is genius. Um, have you ridden the, this before? Oh, yeah, yeah. The uh, lights change. Do you the, have to stop at the light while you're in the bus? They do. Well, you know, if the li if the light's red, yes, they do stop. But the lights do change. I know that they're probably. I don't know if they're ti or not timed, but they are triggered by the bus being there because they turn relatively quickly after buses That's arrive. That's good. You can tell. Um, so, uh, so you, yeah. you zoom through the the valve. Oh yeah, getting from much quicker than a car. Absolutely, absolutely, and because you can, and because it's diagonal. It goes from northwest to southeast. There's nowhere else you can do that. Everything else is you're going to make a big L. You yeah. got to go down the freeway and then go, you know, go south and then go east, or you got to do the other way. And those are long ass blocks in the valley. Yeah, yeah, they can be certainly. Um, but uh, yeah, the Orange Line path is nice. Walking across the campus of uh, LA Valley College is like, well, it's nice. You know, it was, it's a it's its own pleasant little thing. Um, L.A. Valley College is nicely landscaped. They're doing a lot of stuff to conserve water there. It's really kind of neat. Ooh. Um, you know, and uh, it was uh, not a terrible place to spend uh, pandemic time. All right, Rob, before we go, 
Is there any other place in Valley Glen that I want to impress a girl? Well, you know, it, th they'll say they are in North Hollywood, but they're very definitely in Valley Glen is Tonga Hut up on Victory. And they are Tonga Hut is the oldest tiki bar in Los Angeles. What? Oldest continuously operating was open, open, I don't know, like a year or so, so before Tiki Tea, I believe. And huh. uh, yeah, so uh, it, it kind of fell into sort of local bar fly joint for a while. But then in the last 15 years or so, it was sort of uh, reacquired by some true believers and they've put in a lot of decor and they have events there. They have parking lot events and sales and they have bands and they have a uh, rum club, which is great. <sighs> Learn about rum. One of my favorite things. Are, are, are you a tiki drinker? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Actually, again, going back to pan pandemic, one of the things I learned how to do was make a Mai Tai during pandemic. Is it hard to make? It's got a bunch of ingredients. It's got, I don't know, eight ingredients in it. And then oh. there's, you know, I was making zombies and Navy grogs and all the other stuff too, because it was fun and I didn't have anything else to do. So I could sit there and didn't have to go anywhere. So could drink as many uh, fruity drinks as I wanted to. How interesting that the lie is we're in North Hollywood. <laughs> I think it's because people know North Hollywood. Like if you say right. North Hollywood, generally people have an idea. And if you say Valley Glen, like you have no idea where it is. <laughs> well, but you've educated us. And there's, they are a stone's throw from North Hollywood. Like if you cross the 170, I think, I think then you're in North Hollywood. Yeah. They're not far from it, but uh, yeah, they are actually within the confines of uh, Valley Glen. So this is Tonga Hut. Tonga Hut. Uh, free parking? They have a parking lot, minimal parking in the parking lot. And there's, there, you know, there's a neighborhood behind them and you can find street parking usually. Although but like, you know what? Take a lift, take an Uber because you're going to you be go. drinking. I, I live a mile and a half away from there. And the, I don't know, last how many ever times I've gone, I've taken a, you know, ride share over there because. You're going to get wasted. Yeah. Uh, uh, I love the Tiki Tea in part because the drinks are really strong, delicious. Absolutely. Um, but they can be a little pricey. Is it the same over there? Uh, you know, the, the drinks are cheap, but when you're paying, you know, $15 for a drink or $18 for a drink, it's got three, four ounces of alcohol. And, you know, it's, it's strong. And some of those, some of those rums are, you know, overproof rum. So you're, you're getting a lot for your money. You don't need to drink too many zombies or too many Mai Tais to, you know, start feeling like you're in the tropics. You're basically getting two drinks anyways. Yes. And even, even the lightest, smallest drink in uh, most tiki bars is going to be a double. Right. At least. And that's the problem is they go down real easy and then you don't realize that you've had, <laughs> you know, five doubles and you're, uh, you know, you're a little bit woozy by the time you leave. And I imagine a really good vibe in there. Yeah, yeah, there's, you know, there's, it's a mix like Tiki Tea. You go to certain nights and it's the sort of true believer, Tiki file people are there. And then, you know, if you go in there on a Friday night, it's just Friday night people going in there and, you know, having a party, wanting to whip it up, wanting to do something different. So it's a total, you know, depends on when you go. Any TVs? Can I watch a sporting event? No, no TVs. Oh. Tiki bar, Tiki Tea is an exception, but. Tiki people don't like uh, TVs in their tiki bar. They d oh, well, you know what? Well, they did actually. This is a long time ago. They did have a TV that was there, but it showed they would just have old movies on it, like surf mo movies. Yeah, and, and yeah, a range of stuff. Actually, I totally forgot about that. But I think that's been taken down, if I'm not mistaken. But it's <laughs> it's been a long time since a I've been believer. there. Honestly, what's this doing here? Yeah, yeah. It it was a. It was a holdover, I think, from the days of it being sort of like the local bar fly joint. You know, it was just a bar where people rolled in there at 9 a.m. when they opened and, uh, you know, stayed there all day long. Well, I think this is perfect. Tonga Hut. Tonga Hut. And they don't open at 9 a.m. anymore. But yeah, so it's just uh, west of the 170 on Victory, right across from the Regal Cinemas, the big, tall. Oh, yeah. Building there. And I think it's. Uh, Cold water. I think they're just, uh, no, not cold water. Yeah, cold water. Rob, great seeing you again. Good to see you, sir. Thank you so much for traversing from Valley Glen. Glen, yes. It's your good friend, Valley Glen. <laughs> it is your good friend. If your name was Glen, no, you saying... couldn't really live anywhere else but 
Valley Glen. But because I'm saying that's what it should say under the sign. Your friend. Your your good friend. Yeah. You've just coined a phrase. We're your <laughs> what does Valley Village and all the rest of the places do? Uh, it takes right over a, here is Virgil Village. Takes a village, I guess. Yeah. Well, God bless you. I'm glad you're healthy. Glad you're he- happy. You look Thank great. You, you got a full head of hair. That's I, that's I, all I, I got. That's what I got going for me. <laughs> I, I I lost weight during pandemic. You do look trimmer by walking. Yeah, it's great. Pa- apparently, if you move around a little bit, I wouldn't know anything calories. about that. Thanks you so much, my man. Thank you. Thank you for having me, man. How great was Rob? You know who we'd like to down fruity drinks with in a tiki bar? Our Patreons. When you stoke us, you're saying, yes, people like Rob Matter, as do his stories, as do his record collection. Sure, you can interview a ton of household names, but you chose normal, smart, funny dudes like Rob, and we appreciate it. So shout out to our Patreons, Nancy Rommelman, Sean Atlow, Matt Mills, Sean Wallace, Greg and Molly, Jamie Taylor, Mark Johnson, Kira Ann, Barney Grinky, Ben Welsh, Henry Furman, Jen Adams, The Lonely Chair, Trevor Wilson, Bree Wild, Dougie Gyro, Christina Way Up North, and Rob and Carrie. Want to hear your name at the end of next week's show? Go to patreon.com slash here in LA and give till it hurts. Also, shout out to our Angelinos. To be an Angelino, all you've got to do is PayPal us 25 bucks or more, and we will list you on the Here in LA website forever. Or in this case, uh, the Medium page until I can get the other one to hear in LA. You will also be given a number to denote how early you got in to make the dream come alive. Angelino number one, the delightful Allie Miller. Number two, the beautiful George Wright. Number three, the nearly birthday girl, Rita Joanne. Number four, the mysterious Jason Sutter. Number five, the brave Grant Houghton. Number six, the uh, probably sweating Rob Baker way out there. And number seven, uh, the, uh, the man who knows all about the foods, Kev Chang. Number eight, also in a valley, Brenda Garcia. And number nine, the man that they named Griffith Park after? John Griffiths. Just PayPal your hard-earned cash to busblog at gmail.com. Want to support us, but you're marching to protect the rights of women? Good. You can still help. Post your favorite episode on your Facebook. Post too! Ooh! Tweet something nice about this. Anytime you see me tweet about an episode, retweet it for God's sake. You can even tell your friends. Tell them how Here in L.A. is spelled, and it's on Apple Podcasts, and Google, and Spotify, and now on Amazon. Mmm. Jeff Bezos. Here in L.A. is produced by myself, Tony Pierce, and a man who knows Rob, too, Jordan Katz. Editing, mixing, and music supervision by Jordan Katz. Songs by Oregon and Jordan Katz. Special thanks to the delightful Cindy for creating the logo, Jen for inspiring this, and all our former co-workers at E. Especially, Especially the cool, cool. cool.